Thomas Derrick. My name is uh, Dr. Michael Yoon. Call me Michael. This is Dr. Jimmy Kwok, MD, who does the PRP injection. Some of you have met him. And this is Connor Downs from Harvest Centrifuge System. So three of us are gonna do kind of a shared workshop, uh, showing some perspective on our part, his part, and of course Connor's part about kind of a differentiating factor of different types of PRP and how it, it's helpful and some of the evidence that actually backs it up. Perfect. So first of all, before we kind of go into details about the types of PRP and all these evidence behind it, uh, I want to kind of explain to you my personal experience with PRP. Um, as some of you know, I'm a martial artist since I was three years old. I've been training and I used to train like crazy, as if there's like no tomorrow. Uh, so that's me doing like a lot of flying kicks and stuff like that. And unfortunately, 30 years ago, I injured my knee doing a, some kicking. And uh, with that injury, I actually tore my meniscus. And at that time, luckily, they didn't cut my knees open. They did orthoscopic, but they did a routine, uh, you know, ortho, uh, meniscus men meniscectomy. So I'm missing posterior meniscus on my right knee. And so basically, it prevent it creates a bone on bone impact on my right knee. And this is something that's been really kind of um, always been in my mind. And my first uh, experience with PRP was actually 15 years ago in, in Asia. And I had PRP done on my wrist. And that's when I found out about the effect of PRP. I didn't know the quality of PRP at that time, but all I knew is it, it actually works. So right now I actually do PRP on my knee annually once a year for a preventative uh, reason and it has really helped me a lot and you can see from my training I still kick and train and stuff like that without any problem knock on wood uh, that's one of my students there uh, and obviously I don't train like the way I used to but this is Dr. Jimmy Kwok who has been doing a PRP injection on me I kind of did a little speed lapse video and afterwards I follow up using a class 4 labor laser to speed up the process. Now, the thing is, a lot of times people say, well, is PRP really for me? Like, is it really gonna help? But, and sometimes people say, I have a knee issue, I need PRP. I have shoulder issue, I have PRP. But the problem is, is it may not be something you need right off the bat. So we have to kind of really see and check whether or not you have that knee problem related to just the knee itself, or it's because of alignment or flat foot or rotation of the spine. So we do a thorough assessment, and the thorough assessment allows me to do history, examination, take some x-ray, determine whether or not that problem is actually joint related, alignment related, and if it is an alignment related, there are things that we can do before doing PRP to actually achieve success. So doing PRP right away is like changing a, car, a tire on a car that may need an alignment first. So, there's a spinal contribution, and I'm going to talk about knee, but PRP does work for other parts of the body. It works for the shoulder, the hip, wrist, everywhere. But we're going to focus on the knee today because otherwise I'm going to be talking so much about mm -hmm. different scenario. So anyone, everyone can see this, right? Our structure really affects how our hip and legs are positioned. So for instance, if our body is actually leaning to the side, it actually uh, causes positional problem to the knee. And when that happens, it puts more stresses to the knee, leading to some inflammation. So this is an example of a spine that I did an x-ray of a patient, and this is joint. And you can see from the left side, relatively pretty good space, but on the right side, it's kind of closing up and causing some degenerative changes. So I like to think of the cartilage and knee joint almost like an eraser. So if you take an eraser and you press on it and you really press hard, the eraser actually wears down more, right? But if you take the pressure off the eraser, then the eraser doesn't erase as much. So we need to really deal with the structure first before we can go ahead and try and treat that area. So typically, when you look at the knee joint, the knee is actually covered with cartilage and the cartilage allows proper gliding. Unfortunately, due to aging and a lot of the different factors that cause deterioration, it can cause wear and tear to the cartilage and eventually it leads to exposure of the bone on bone and leading to osteophytes and degenerative changes. So there's many different grades, grade one, two, three, and four being severe. And I find that PRP could work obviously for more preventative reason, but also during that corrective phase as well. Okay. So contributing factors for knee problem is like lifestyle. So if you're sedentary and you're gaining weight 
and you're putting some abnormal pressure in the knee joint, it also leads to that. Your diet also causes a problem. So if you're eating a lot of inflammatory food that leads to arthritic changes, then it's always gonna inflame. Smoking, drinking, that doesn't really help out with the joints as well. And some of the injuries like sports and trauma, such as myself doing martial art, injured through knee. But a lot of these factors could contribute to some knee injuries and eventually lead to arthritic changes. Now, I also recommend people taking supplements. I think how, taking some supplements such as glucosamine, chondritin, MSM, uh, collagen type two, these are all kind of an ingredients that you can actually orally take in and create a precursor for GAG that actually helps with protection of cartilage in your joints as well. So some of you who are my patients, you probably kind of noticed that you should be taking some of these supplements to actually help it out. Try to avoid kind of a generic brand that doesn't really absorb the body. But all in all, taking supplementation with proper treatment to the body is very, very important as well. So I feel that when one structure starts to fail, it affects other structure. So for instance, if your muscles and tendons are starting to get atrophied and weak, it puts pressure on the ligament and cartilage. And eventually that ligament cartilage, which fails, eventually puts pressure on the bone and causes arthritis. And eventually as with aging, your body just cannot recuperate. So we have to kind of look at the whole body as a whole team. So it's just like a NASCAR or F1 formula racing. You see all these people kind of working together. There is time and place for self-care along with PRP as well. So such as adjustment, laser, shockwave, acupuncture, even personal training, uh, anti-inflammatory foods, supplementation, they all work in synergy. A lot of times when people say, oh, I think I need PRP, we don't know that. However, if you're gonna get PRP done, you might as well get really high quality one, and make sure that it's going to actually help you. People do need to exercise, stretching is important, cardiovascular workout is important, and doing some. So this is an example of an MRI of a 70 year old who has good muscle mass, and also a 70 year old who is inactive, has very little muscle and a lot of fat. So when you don't have this girth to protect the joint, your muscle actually creates an anti-gravity fa factor. So if your muscles are not working, putting a lot of stress on the joint, again, leading to degenerative changes to the cartilage and to the meniscus as well. Now, the problem with knee, it doesn't actually have direct blood supply to the knee joint. So it relies on osmosis and diffusion. So when you have blood flow, the blood, the body actually filtrates it and creates a synovial fluid, which actually has a nutrient. And so if you don't have this proper nutrient into the knee joint, even though you don't really do much, it causes accelerated degeneration and deterioration as well. So that's where PRP, platelet-rich plasma treatment comes in and helps with the healing at a rapid pace. So there's three things that I think is very, very important in PRP system is the method of treatment, meaning is it just PRP that you need and do everything wrong, or you need to kind of combine it with good lifestyle? That's method. Second is type of PRP, which um, Connor is going to explain a little bit more thoroughly. And then afterwards, who actually does it and how it's done? Is it done through kind of blindly or is it used with ultrasound? And also a follow up after the PRP treatment. Okay. So I'm going to hand over the presentation to Dr. Kwok now. Good. Okay. So my name is Dr. Kwok. I work at Rocky uh, Channel Hospital. Um, so you may ask, how did I get into this PLP injection? Okay, so I look after kind of uh, doing consultation and look after the inpatient. Yeah? Okay, and the inpatient is an assessment and as well as a rehab uh, unit. So over the last 20 years, yeah, I've seen a lot of elderly people. I mean, you know, they have pain, they have arthritis. Okay, and Constantly, we are bombarded by the health authorities saying that, hey, the population is getting older, we have more people who need knee surgery and kind of surgery and all that. So we spend a lot of time kind of trying to do the rehab and try to get them back on the feet, okay? And, and it's kind of a not, a, not, I mean, we are not really in the battle, obviously, yeah. okay? So then I say, something doesn't make sense. Because when you're born, you're perfectly healthy. Unless you have a gen genetic disorder, 
Okay, everybody is born healthy. It, no one born with osteoarthritis. Okay, so somewhere along the way, something happened. Okay, so how come we don't do something about it at the early stage, which is easy to fix? Okay, but instead, no, we have to deal with you know, end stage arthritis, we have to deal with knee replacement, people with stroke. Okay, why don't we call them early? If you go to see your family doctor, what will they recommend if you have pain in your knee? Okay, and yeah, steroid injection. Okay, well, uh, I like to do more. Okay, so I went to a different area and get training. Okay, and the first time I ran is to the stay, okay, and I'm using ultrasound to guide the injection, okay. So he works in the veterans hospital, okay, and he deal with tons, a lot of patients with osteoarthritis, okay, especially even in women, okay, because a lot of women join the army, they carry what, guess what, 70 kilo of equipment every day and run. These equipment are designed for men, it's not for women, okay? And guess what? They all have osteoarthritis, okay? Other in the hip and knee, okay? So I say, well, what can you do? I mean, besides all the time, no, no, the, the NSAID, the Motran, give them GIB, and still, I don't mean that, PRP. PRP really works, okay? Especially in the early stage, okay? <clears throat> so that's how I get into PRP. Well, guess what? Okay, in medical school, we don't teach PRP. Okay, if you don't believe me, ask your family doctor. You say, What is that? So, this is what I'm trying to do. Okay, is that one? I'm going to show you the evidence. Okay, and I'm going to show you how you compare how PRP compared to other type of treatment, especially steel. Okay, okay, if PRP works that great, how come? The hospital doesn't make him in. How come your family doctor doesn't make him in? Okay. In the end, talk about the current management concept and the summary at the end. Okay. So the first study that I want to bring to your attention, okay, is the one that is recently published, I think in May of this year. Okay. It's very new. Okay. I like this study because it's a double blind study. Well, actually, there are three groups. Okay. One is that they draw 50 cc of blood, central facet, and we inject. The other group is a 40 milligram of a cortical steroid, that's the usual dosage. And the third group is no savings. Assess this group, two group at the baseline, four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and finally a year later, okay? And with x ray comparison, okay, at the baseline and a year. Data. So, red line is PLP, uh, the blue line is cortical steroid, and the gray line is normal saline. Okay. Initially, all these patients have a fair degree of pain. Okay. The one that get the steroid get the most benefit. Okay, the pain really settled down. Okay, the PLP takes a bit longer. Okay, but eventually the pain will settle down quite nicely. Okay and the effect will last up to a year, okay? Now, the normal saline, what about the normal saline, I mean, it does help a bit, yes. It, it does, okay? When patients are suffering from also uh, arthritis, there are three things, the one is pain, the second one is stiffness. So again, okay, the steroid group gives you the best response, okay, in four weeks, okay? and the PLP just gradually catch up, and the effect is sustainable up to a year, okay? Where the steroid group is that's starting to reduce the effect at the end. And the third one is function, okay? So you control my pain, you control my stiffness, but can I still walk? Okay, that's the important thing, okay? So again, steroid work better in four weeks, okay, immediately, okay, and the PLP catch up later, okay, and then this is expected, okay. So okay. in this study, what they do, okay, is another randomized study, okay, published two years ago, is that they assess the patient uh, at baseline, 30 days, 
and half a year later, yes, uh, the pain come down. Okay, in this study, okay, it's the lower score, the better it is. Okay, and and they actually feel that PRP works better. Okay. But when comparing the steroid, there's not much the same, okay, in one month. But then by half year, okay, what they show is that PLP actually work better than steroid. Okay, in terms of controlling of the pain, function, and stiffness. So in this group of people, there's people who has what we call grade two osteoarthritis and grade three arthritis. Okay. So in the end, Okay, so these patients who get PLP, okay, it's about equal number of them remain in stage two, okay, but in patients who get steroid, what they found is that a lot of the people move progress from stage two to stage three, okay. <laughs> now, this study, okay, is another study. Okay, is that they just look at the cartilage change. Okay, so you have two in the knee, you have two big bone, okay, who especially uh, sit on top of each other, okay, and under in between this cartilage, okay, so that you can slide, otherwise, you will have pain all the time. So, in, in this uh, uh, study, is that they inject PRP. Okay, and then they look at the MRI eight months later. Okay, and what you define is that the cartilage volume in the PLP group, okay, everybody can see it here, it's bigger. Okay, mm -hmm. yes, okay. And, and the in, in integrity, okay, remain, okay, but the information, okay, the pretend information is also much less. So in this study, okay, what it shows is that you can see that this patient have uh, osteoarthritis, okay, and there's no, uh, there's uh, sclerosis, and, and the uh, joint space is very narrow, okay, so after PLP, okay, treatment, okay, the space come back up and preserve. Now, <laughs> I'm supposed to replace this study, okay, because we can actually demonstrate here, okay, because Michael have x ray okay, we do take x ray okay, before and after, and what we found is that the patient who have PLP, okay, the joint space opened up, okay, because the cartridge got thicker. Okay, we can actually, the study shows that not only the cartridge get bigger in size, so that you have a better cushion effect, okay? The amount of degradation is much less. So if you have a big, if you, you get some of your cartridge back, or at least a function of cartridge back, what does that mean, okay? Does it really help to preserve the knee? So in this study, I said they look at patients who have PLP injection, okay, compare those who doesn't, and they predict, okay, whether they eventually need a knee replacement, okay, and what it shows is that, yes, if you get PLP injection, it delay, okay, the time that you get that knee replacement, okay, so at least one and a half years and on average about five years, okay, that is a huge thing. So, Steroid, the, the, the way that it uh, works is that it, it, you are like pouring water over a fire, okay? It calm down the chronic inflammation immediately, okay? But we are always reluctant to get it, the steroid in too often, okay? And this is one of the reasons, okay? Is that this person has steroid injection and then they need after a few months, degenerate more. Okay, so steroid has a detrimental effect. Okay, so so we are all kind of, uh, for medical professionals, in uh, almost a catch-22 situations. Okay, on one hand, okay, yeah, I want to settle down the pain. On the other hand, is you know that, oh, if you give too many steroid injections, okay, 
is that we are going to destroy the dog. I have seen cases, so, oh, I have hip pain, let's get a steroid shot, and then eventually it lost infected. Why? Because you destroy the femoral head of the, 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 the hip. Okay, you get what we call the uh, osteonecosis, okay, the entire hip joint. The head of the femoral head scar, so we need to replace it. You will say, Dr. Park, so far, you show us that hey, the, uh, the PLP helps the pain, uh, it helps the function, it helps the study, although it doesn't work as well, not as fast as steroid, okay, but it has a much longer lasting effect, okay, it helps to preserve the cartilage and it delays surgery. So, how come? the medical community is not recommending it. Okay, so if you look at all major uh, uh, society, is that they don't recommend uh, PLP injection, okay? And they say it's a lack of reactivities. Why is that? So I show you all the positive study, okay? And it's fair for me to show you some of the negative study as well. Okay, so this, is this study, okay, is a restore study. Okay, again, uh, this one is developed in one of the major universities in Australia. Okay, it's a double randomized controlled trial. So patient uh, in, in, divided into two groups. One get the normal CNE, and the other one get PLP. Okay, and they really try. It's a very thought out uh, study okay. okay so this is this study okay is a restore study okay again uh, this one is developed in one of the major universities in Australia okay it's a double randomized controlled trial so patient uh, in, in, divided into two groups one get the normal CNE and the other one get PLP okay so they look at the outcome 12 months later okay and they look at the uh, the MRI <coughs> study and also the pain control. So the outcome is disappointing, okay, because when you look at whether it's two months or 12 months, okay, the two groups symptoms in terms of the function, pain, and stiffness is about the same, okay. And the MRI evidence, okay, which is this here, okay, is about the same, okay, there's really no difference, okay. So we say, what is going on, okay? How come one study showed the great improvement and uh, this study, which is really well designed, okay, that's almost like a false design, show a negative result. Big difference, okay, in how they prepare the PLP. So the group, that shows a positive response, okay? So they get 50 cc of your blood and then really concentrate well. So your predict count, okay, per millimeter volume went up to about four to five times, okay? So you'll get a really concentrated PLP, okay? On the other hand, okay, <coughs> the group that shows a negative response, okay, they only get about 10 cc and they concentrate it. So the volume is about 1.6 times more than your normal blood, okay? And I can tell you what model they use. They use Regen Lab, okay? So, if you look at the website, Regen website, okay? <clears throat> yeah, you will say that the central field and the PLP systems work on the osteoarthritis. Okay, but when you look at the study carefully, is that no, they don't just use PLP, they combine with HA, okay? And they do injection at three months, six months, and nine months. Yes, of course, no, but the time you give to, to a year, it shows a response, okay? But you are not talking about PLP, okay? So even the region lab itself, it won't show you Okay, if they are not able to show you the PLP that, that they produce help with osteoarthritis. So the question is that why do these researchers, okay, 
take this system to prepare their PLP because if you talk to any injector, okay, any injector in Canada who deal with joint pain or muscle pain, okay, they will tell you is that they will not use regen, okay, because you are not able to get that high enough concentration, okay, for the prepare process. So what about other studies? So this is again a recent article that uh, that is a uh, uh, prepare. Okay, it's a meta analysis of all the major art, uh, article in the past. Okay, I personally doesn't like meta analysis. Okay, because uh, what it does is that. Uh, so the idea of meta-analysis is to pull all the articles together so that you have a bigger sample, okay, to eliminate the bias. But it also depends on what research paper do you choose. So uh, all the previous uh, uh, study and put them together is that they, they feel that it helps, okay. But they cannot recommend it because the way that they prepare the PLP is so different, okay? So they don't know what to recommend, okay? So that's the main reason why uh, it's not formally recommended by any uh, any uh, colleague. Is that how much should I inject or how concentrated a patient can should I inject? Okay, no one know, okay? Because it's not, not standardized, okay? So, so when you go for your PLP, doesn't matter anywhere. I, I know how much we gave you, okay, or how country it is, but if you go to anywhere else, we have we have no idea what exactly are you getting. Okay, so a lot of the uh, therapeutic effect is depends on how they prepare the PLP. In the years, what I've found in working with clinicians and with patients is that there's a few really big misconceptions that exist within the PRP industry. The first and, and most important is that sort of all PRP preparations are the same. And within that, when we're using PRP in a number of different ways, that we don't necessarily understand why it's working, how it's working, the results are inconsistent, or it's largely uh, a result of uh, where I'm placing it uh, that's ultimately going to determine whether or not it's going to be successful. And a lot of us probably have spoken with friends that PRPs work really, really well for, and other friends that it hasn't worked, or some that got three injections and some that got one. It's really difficult to make heads or tails of it. You know, today we have, when I had three, now there's hundreds of different systems. When there were 12 doctors, now there's thousands. And so when you're going online, you're looking at a lot of different platelet-rich plasma providers. Some charge very low, some charge very high. It's very difficult to make heads or tails of it all. And so patients as well as clinicians will often look at all that and say, well, I'll just get access to PRP, I'll make it an, an option for patients and then leave it up to them to decide whether or not they kind of want to roll that dice. And that's a really big problem for patients. Really the solution to all of that is representative of, of what's already been discussed here, right? Is really leveraging modern research, is really understanding the science of PRP, how it's gonna work best for your patients, prioritizing patients and their unique pain points and, and physiology, and ultimately optimizing the PRP treatment by selecting the right tools for the job, the right preparation for the job, and giving your patients the best possible chance for success. It's equally as important for you to be able to at least vet some information that you're reading online or ask questions of any clinician that you're speaking with about PRP to better understand whether you are in fact getting what you should be getting. When we're looking at PRP preparations, there's really sort of five major criteria that we can look at. And all really is spin type. There's double spin systems, there's single spin systems. And those really drive a number of different sort of downstream influences on PRP. The first and most important is platelet concentrate. It's called platelet-rich plasma, right? And platelets is first and foremost the most important driver of regeneration and regenerating tissue and getting you back to a healthier, more pain-free you. So systems generally can be classified by high or low platelet concentrations. Now we can see that generally higher concentration systems are usually baselined at four and above, and that's the number of relative platelets to what would typically be found in whole blood. And then we have low, which is less than two. There's also uh, certain blood cell concentrations as they pertain to white cells and red cells. So those are the blood cells that exist in whole blood and we may want to include and we may want to remove. Uh, white cells are 
uh, potent immunomodulators, so they help to control inflammation, they help to clear out debris, and in many cases that's beneficial depending on what exactly your injury is. In other cases, we don't want any of that. They can be inflammatory uh, to, in many respects, and so you know if you're suffering from chronic inflammation, like with uh, you know osteoarthritis, for example, or other sort of joint pathologies, maybe we don't want that. There's anticoagulants, which I won't necessarily get into right now. And then there's activation, which is another tool that your clinician may choose to use uh, if they feel that it would be beneficial for you. But ultimately you can see through all these different types of classifications, I can create so many different types of preparations. And if I was to just choose one and kind of use it ubiquitously across my practice for every patient that showed up saying they wanted a PRP injection, maybe because I offered it at a lower rate than anyone else, you can see how that might create a problem. So really quick, I wanna go through spin types because this is something, this is a simple question you can ask to determine right away whether or not you're gonna be getting a high concentration PRP product or a low concentration PRP product. You can ask the question, or if you're getting the process done, and just see how long it takes for them to come back and do the injection. So as Dr. Kwok mentioned, generally speaking, when we're spinning down whole blood, we're separating it out into various cell fractions. And if we spin it down a single time, and we don't spin it very, very quickly, we'll get sort of a natural separation of the larger cells, which are largely the red cells, to the plasma fraction, which holds some proteins and cytokines, some of the smaller molecular entities. And then sort of somewhere in the middle is where we find platelets and white cells, but in sort of an unconcentrated way. And that process is generally going to take anywhere between four to eight minutes. It's a single spin, we'll draw off what's on top. Now, what we typically get out of that is what we consider a Luke's core PRP. So it's really just plasma. There's no red cells, there's no white cells, and there's very, very few, if any, platelets. Certainly no more than two times of baseline, oftentimes much lower than that. Now, when we look at double spins, and I'll use the harvest system as a representative system because I'm very familiar with it, and it's also a very representative double spin system. So we're lacing whole blood into a central chamber. We're then spinning it the first time. And within that central chamber, there's also technology that allows us to influence the degree of separation of the different blood cells uh, based on their cell densities. And that allows us to really separate out the cells we don't want. So some of the larger white cells, which are super inflammatory, they're called granulocytes. And then red cells, which by and large, we don't really ever want in a PRP preparation. Now, once we've done that, we haven't concentrated the platelets yet to any meaningful degree. This is where some systems stop. And with the harvest system, we go through a second spin. So we're gonna pour out all the good stuff that we just separated. We're gonna move it into a second chamber. It's all done in the system. And then we spin it a second time. We spin it really, really quickly. And that concentrates all the platelets that we just isolated from the big red cells and the big white cells. We concentrate them at the bottom of the system. We'll pull off the plasma on top that generally isn't very useful for us. There's not much in there. And we'll take that lower fraction, which represents our PRP injectate. And these systems characteristically will have white cells, some red cells as well. We can remove those later in a third step if we want to. But what's most important is that we're gonna have a really high concentration of platelets, often more than five times above baseline. Now this is just a brief overview of some of the different commercial preparation systems. And we sort of classified them by single spin and double spin. And again, if you're in an office and you're getting a PRP procedure done and the clinician leaves the room after drawing the blood and they come back in five minutes, you're getting a single spin product. There's no double spin product that can be done in five minutes, unless they hit one minute twice, then I suppose, but that's not really something that's achievable. Double spin systems are typically gonna take at least 15 minutes. So if you're sitting there waiting for more than 15 minutes, you may very well be getting a double spin product. But what the common theme is that with double spin products, you're getting a very, very high increase in platelets above baseline. With single spin systems, you're getting a very, very negligible increase by baseline, no more than two times. And the nice thing is, is that this particular table also separates it based on leukocyte, uh, the presence of leukocytes. And again, I mentioned earlier that sometimes it's beneficial. For example, if you're injecting into a tendon, any soft tissue, if you have tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, things like that, we actually want some white cells in there to stimulate the inflammatory process and kind of give your body another opportunity to heal itself, of which inflammation is a critical sort of initial phase of that. So some systems tend to do the leukocyte rich prep and then the leukocyte poor prep as well is something that, as I mentioned earlier, we don't really want any red or white cells in a joint space, for example. 
And uh, the nice thing here is that when you see with the, the only system here that's really able to produce both is the Smart Prep 2 system. And so uh, it's a system that's going to allow you to produce the optimal PRP preparation depending on exactly what your unique disease state is. And we'll go over a little bit more in detail why certain preparations like Luxem 4 may not work optimally in soft tissue. So this is another uh, table that really goes through probably the five major PRP systems. And I've just highlighted again, the increase over baseline. And I'll draw your attention to the product at the bottom, which is the Regen Lab Kit. And I wasn't really a part of Dr. Kwok putting together his presentation, so this is more just serendipity for me. Uh, but the Restore trial, as he mentioned, used the Regen Lab Kit. And you'll see that, uh, you know, over, I believe it was uh, 60 or so samples, they were producing a PRP product that was actually lower than a whole blood value. So you actually would have gotten a better response, I speculate, but I assume you would get a better response if we just drew your blood and injected it right away, you get more play. And so you see again, so we, we kind of cascade up and then the smart prep system at the top, just to give you some ideas to uh, the percent increase over another system like Regen Kit, we're 5.8 times of a baseline, which is more or less 12 times more platelets per dose than what you'd be getting at the Regen. Uh, lab and, th and these are these are important factors. I'm sure we've all had uh, musculoskeletal pain where we've gone. We've tried sort of regular strength ibuprofen, and then you take one of those, and then you try extra strength. It's a little better, and then you double that up, and all of a sudden it's a heck of a lot better, right? These are some of the similarities that we see with PRP systems as well. And when we look at number of injections, this is where it goes back to you may have a friend that's had three, four, or five injections, and at the fifth injection they felt great. Well, perhaps they were getting five injections of a, a product similar to Regen Lab, where after the fifth injection, they might have gotten enough platelets to make some meaningful difference. But with some of the uh, double spin systems that produce a higher concentration of platelets and deliver it in a single injection, you're delivering so much more at once. And so there's not necessarily a need to go back for three, four, five injections possibly. And again, just to conclude, really, what does Harvest PRP at Century Wellness mean for you as patients? It really means that you're gonna have access to all of these pieces of information, anecdotes, technologies that we've talked about and that have been supported by clinical and scientific evidence. Okay, you're gonna have a flexible platform, you're gonna be able to produce PRP in different volumes, different concentrations, optimal concentrations. You can have it with white cells in it, you can have it without white cells in it, depending on what you need. I don't know if everyone here had their knee injected or if there was a knee, if there was an elbow, a shoulder, no. of indications and obviously I can't build a house with just a wrench. I need a whole lot of different tools in order to do so. And so uh, that's really uh, you know, what this platform is all about. Uh, and then as, uh, as Michael said, I mean, I'm not saying that it's, it's the best system on the market, but what I can say is that it was the first system to the market in Canada. The team at Harvest Rumo has been developing PRP systems now for over 25 years and we're still around. So I think that we must be doing something right. So Hawk has kind of mentioned from his own perspective as a medical doctor, why he used PRP over steroid. He also emphasized the difference in research, showing biased research where it shows it's not effective and the research that are really good that shows effectiveness and it's not standardized. That's why a lot of medical doctors may be confused as well in recommending PRP. Connor mentioned about different type of system and this is something that's very, very important. Not only that, um, who does it is very important. We have a very experienced doctor who's able to inject a very high quality PRP system uh, produced by Harvest, along with my clinical skills, a pre-work for Dr. Park to actually work with. Because a lot of times when people come to our clinic, they don't just say, I need PRP on my knee, or they may say, I need PRP on me, and we would, we would say, maybe you don't. Maybe you need something else before that. So we need to allow your body to be more stable, so it's like what he says, stabilize the ligament, then do the treatment. And so we're in the best interest of our clients and patients as much as possible. Oh, that's great. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.